afternoon. Uh, first, I would like to apologize for these technical problems. And as you heard, my intention is to offer you my readings of, in fact, two paintings by Nastaroids. First is self-portrait painted at the ve very beginning of the First World War uh, in 1914, and it is entitled Symbolist Self-Portrait and subtitled and signed as Me, the Fighter, Me, 1914. And the other painting is her work made 14 years later between two world wars, a painting from 1928 that reversed somehow on the boat on the First World War and the war that will follow. And it's entitled Our Age. Uh, I base my readings to her autobiographical text um, for it exists in one private collection, her unpublished autobiography. It consisted of 267 uh, typed pages. Uh, never published, and Nastaroiz began to write it at the age of 35 in 1918, and she wrote it for the two years. But uh, at the mere beginning, with regard to the title and theme of this symposium that is exploring the war legacy, I would like to remind you on the words by famous and one of the most important modernist writer, writers, Gertrude Stein, that she published in her book that was published, in fact, in 1938, and it's titled Picasso by Gertrude Stein. It reads, it reads, quote, no war is ever ended, of course not. It, it only has the appearance of stopping. It is an extraordinary thing, but it is true. Wars are only a means of publicizing the things already accomplished. A change, a complete change has come about. People no longer think as they were thinking, but no one knows except the creators. The spirit of everybody is changed, of a whole people is changed, by, but mostly nobody knows it, and war forces them to recognize it because during the war, the appearance of everything changes very much quicker, but really the entire change has been accomplished and the war is so only something which forces everybody to recognize it. The French Revolution was over when war forced everybody to recognize it. The American Revolution was accomplished before the war, the war is only a publicity agent which makes everyone know what has happened. Yes, it is that. So, then the public recognizes a creator who has seen the change which has been accomplished before war and which has been expressed by the war. And by the war, the world is forced to recognize the entire change in everything. They are forced to look at the creator who, before anyone, knew it and expressed it. A creator is not in advance of his generation, but he is the first of his contemporaries to be conscious of what is happening to his generation. A creator who creates, who is not an academician, who is not some who studies in school where the rules are already known, and of course being known, they no longer exist. A creator then who creates, it's necessarily of his generation, his generation lives in its contemporary way, but they only live in it. In art, in literature, in the theater, in short, in everything that does not contribute to their immediate comfort, they live in the preceding generation." End of quote. Gertrude Stein, the American writer who lived almost all her life in Paris, participated in the First World War driving her old Ford truck around the countryside, dispensing with her life partner, Alice B. Toklas, supplies to the French war hospitals. You can see the image uh, they titled, uh, uh, they called uh, their old Ford auntie, and uh, the adventures with Auntie are detailed described in her famous autobiography by Alice B. Toklas, published in 1933. Uh, in her still unpublished autobiography entitled Shadows, Like and Darkness from My Life, written in the curse of 1918 and 1919, 
Croatian painter Nasta Reutz depicts the events from June 1914, when the First World War began. In the text, she mentions the question that she posed to herself when the war broke out. Quote, am I obliged to participate in this struggle? End of quote. The question is probably answered in her self-portraits painted in 1914 and entitled The Symbolist Self-Portrait. On its back, there is her signature, Me, the Fighter, Me, 1914. Displaying herself in drag, in an elegant male suit, in a white shirt with a stiffened high collar, with a tie, showing herself as an elegant dandy, hair tied with a red silk, silk scarf and a black shallow wide-rimmed hat, with a pirate earring in her left ear, her gaze directed straight towards someone who is looking at the painting, Nastaroids insists on the first person singular, on the pronoun I, on her own definition, the fighter, in concrete moment of her own history. In my knowledge, the symbol is self-portrait by Nastaroids is the earliest self-portrait in drag painted by the, by the woman artist. The most famous one painted by the expatriated American Romaine Brooks was made nine years later in 1923 in Paris. Uh, that this uh, uh, Romaine Brooks self-portrait is also known under the title self-portrait with the ruins, and that ruins, among others, also refer to the First World War. For Romaine Brooks uh, arrived in Paris in 1902 and spent uh, the First World War in France. After Romaine Brooks' retrospective exhibition that took place in 2000 in Washington's National Museum of M Women in the Arts, when her for decades forgotten and in the context of modernist aesthetics and the history of art, marginalized work was revalorized, the extension of the notion of the avant-garde was, was, was revised as well. The opus of the expatriate American Parisian was labeled as being avant-garde. That label was not based on formal innovations, but on the invention of certain language within representational procedures. It was a language by which certain sexual identities prohibited by discursive normative heterosexism had been made visible. These identities, once they got such a visual signifiers, became intelligible. One of these signifiers is drag, as Judith Butler elaborated at the mere end of the 20th century in her seminal books, Gender Trouble and Bodies That Matter. Despite the fact that in the period between the two world wars, Nastaroids was acclaimed as a portrait painter, after the Second World War, she has been practically erased from the genealogy of Croatian modern art. Significance of some of her works has systematically been overlooked. But she was the only Croatian artist who was at the very beginning of the 20th century fully aware that the race, class, gender, and sexual oppression worked together in mutual intertwinement. She was born in 1983 in the upper class family and her father was at a high political position in Croatia that was the constitutive part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire until the end of the First World War. <coughs> During the first decade of the 20th century, she studied painting in Vienna and Munich, but was dissatisfied by the conservatism of the Austrian and German art schools. From the autobiography she began to write at the age of 35, we come to know that she found herself in Venice visiting the most important contemporary art exhibition when the war broke out. The same text expresses her contempt for the Austro-Hungary and a deep belief in the pan-Slavic idea. In 1914, that belief led her to curate the comprehensive traveling exhibition that consisted of works by women artists coming from the South Slavic countries ruled by Austro-Hungary and the women artists from Serbia. In the autobiography, she describes her project by the fo following words, quote, my project was completed. The first exhibition of all Yugoslavian women artists and of our popular home industry should be opened in autumn in Ljubljana. 
I will choose the best works there and continue in winter, first in Prague, then in Lviv, and until spring in St. Petersburg, Petersburg to show to our northern brothers a bit of our sunshine." End of quote. In the text of the autobiography, she paid special attention to 27th and 28th of June of 1914. Namely, as she decided to travel on June 27th from Rijeka to Venice to see Biennale, the world's most important contemporary art ex exhibition at that time, she was warned by the acquaintance, the state attorney, whom she met in hotel, not to travel because the war to Serbia will be declared. Nastaroj told him that she thought, quote, the Austrian diplomats would not be so bloodthirsty to provoke the European war, neither so stupid to destroy Austria by themselves with such step. They will not dare to send their malcontent Slavic people on their brothers. Hence, I departed for Venice calmly and in a good mood." End of quote. Certainly, she was wrong. The sentences quoted above are followed by the chapter entitled Disappointment. The autobiographic text reads, quote, on June 28th evening, we went on Lido to take a rest from sightseeing. Our cheerful conversation was interrupted by the noisy clamor of Colporter. La guerra, la guerra, Austria contra la Serbia, la guerra. Howsoever, the better dirty Italian who was bouncing and waving with the newspapers and the guard who theatrically and noisy arrested him were funny, something inside me had frozen. Will Austria really force its nations to raise the weapons to their brothers? And I saw the blood and our moral sufferings. The frolic was silenced. In the cafe at the Mark Square, I read several newspapers and realized that the European war really began, the war against the Slavs, the war that was supposed to open for Germany so desired path to East. I thought that that war could free us very soon if we spill enough martyrs' blood. At the exhibition in the middle of Mestrovich's room, the model of Vidovdan's temple was set. He intended to place it at Kosovo Field. Three places for the monuments were projected inside the temple, the monument to the Kosovo battle, the monument to the liberation from the Turks, and the third place was still empty. I predicted that after the war, the monument to the liberation of brothers who suffered for the centuries under the Austrian yoke will be installed there. <clears throat> but I had to go home as quick as possible. The Italian frame of mind to join to stronger and luckier made me forebode that Italy would declare the war to Austria. If the Austrian diplomats think the same, the borders could be closed. I would like to stay here and observe the battle from distance. I thought that it couldn't last more, more than a few months, and after that I could be able to return into liberated homeland. But then I imagined the sufferings impedent to all the people close to me. I realized that I should participate in the battle and felt ashamed. So I didn't even express my selfish wish. When we arrived back in Rijeka, that we left three days ago as we, heard, as we had departed for a short excursion, our way out from the ship was blocked by the armed power that in German language required our identification cards. I expected that we should pass through the dangerous crowds of our fighting people who would rather be killed at their homeland soil than to raise a hand on the liberators. But Rijeka was quite quiet that day. Cortages of Dalmatians were silently passing, guarded by several bayonets, as a feeble herd on its way, way to the slaughterhouse. Wasn't there really nobody to, de to tell that people that their strength light lies in their concord? On our way to hotel, we met another group in which I found an answer to my high treasonable thoughts. Young men in chains, each guarded by several bayonets, the people follow them in silence. Sometimes the silent comment should be heard. Another one deserter. Eight of them were executed in the morning. Too bad for this honest and healthy young man." End of quote. <clears throat> in such circumstances, Nastaroz had to cancel the exhibition she enthusiastically prepared. 
She still hoped to see the signs of Croatian uprising against Austria, but when returned home in Zagreb, she witnessed quite the contrary situation. A lot of shops possessed by the citizens of Serbian ethnicity were destroyed and burned. She was disgusted by it and considered it as a psychopathic, a psychopathic phenomenon. She wrote, quote, a rebel did in Zagreb the same as the pro-Italians in Rijeka. My heart was frozen when I heard in tram the lady, who was supposed to be intelligent, telling that the, the, the destruction of Serbian shops was okay. She talked me about the recent arson as, she, as the legitimate patriotic deed. I heard that brutality from the mouth of woman, respected woman. I recalled the French Revolution and the other psychopathic phenomena in masses and the role usually played by women. I was above all ashamed of my sex. Where is their mind and heart, infatuated, as a cattle herd mad of the red rag? How I felt lonely, and, end of quote. Was the shame of her own sex the reason for making the self-portrait in a male suit and giving it the title symbolist self-portrait, me, the fighter, me, 1914? What would such symbolism mean? The path to answer leads through her autobiographical text, Shadows, Light and, Light and Darkness. She wrote, uh, quote, People are stultified by the enemy's mercenaries. The bishop blesses from the pulpit the wild horde's fraternal slaughter. The prisons are full of our best people. The, the gallows leap. Austria doesn't have a food. We are hungry. There is no hemp and linen, but there is enough rope for our gallows. The roses smell on blood. The stars narrate me the horrors. The suffering vibrates in the air. When I dip a brush in the paint, I feel as I dip it in blood and mud. I cannot paint. For whom should I do it?" End of quote. She also wrote that while she was struggling with her own thoughts, she was escaping to herself reading Oscar Wilde's stories. There is a metonymic relation between the symbolism of Nastaroid's self-portrait, Me, the Fighter, Me, 1914, and Wilde's dandism and his literary aestheticism. As with, as with Wilde, who was in 1895 convinced and imprisoned for gross indecency, Reutz was also homosexual. Right after the First World War, she met her life partner, British officer Alexandrina Onslow, with whom she lived in Zagreb until the end of Onslow's life in 1949. As a member of Scottish Women's Hospitals, SWH, Alexandrina Onslow spent the war time at Rus Russian and the Salonika fronts. Scottish Women's Hospitals was an organization with strong links with the women's suffrage movement in Scotland, drawing financial support from the U National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies. Members of, of SWH were feminists who believed that women should play an active part in national life. In wartime, this primarily meant giving succor to the sick and wounded. However, they met with severe setbacks. When they offered the services to the Britain Army, British Army during the First World War, they, they were rebuted. In contrast, the French and Serbian armies welcomed their help. As a consequence, from the start of the First World War, the Scottish women's hospitals set up field hospitals, dressing stations, and other medical units in France and Serbia from 1914. Later, they moved into Russia, Romania, Corsica, and Salonika. Throughout the war, they provided doctors, nurses, ambulance drivers, orderlies, and cooks. When the First World War was over, Alexandrina Onslow and several of her colleagues ran the orphanage for 60 children in Bajna Bashta in Serbia. According to Nastaroit's unpublished text titled History of M.A. Onslow, who lives 21 years in Zagreb with N.R., written in 1947, Onslow was disappointed by the corruption in Belgrade that became the capital of the kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, established after the war, that same country became later the kingdom of Yugoslavia.
The Yugoslav authorities even closed her orphanage. From the letters Nastaroids wrote to her parents during her stay in England and in Scotland from 1922 to 1925, we learn that she was disappointed by the new South Slavic state established after the collapse of Austro-Hungary, the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. She was the opponent of the dominant Great Serbian policy. Instead of the one-woman show she was offered in London in 1925, she wanted to curate the exhibition of Croatian art. From her early childhood until her death in 1964, she has been, con she has been convinced leftist. At, the, at her retrospective exhibition that took place in the Art Pavilion in Zagreb in 1938, she exhibited the painting Our Age, made in 1928 that is formally and performatively close to the European avant-garde critical art practices, such as German movement New, new Objectivity, or to certain works by the Berlin Dada. In 1928, when she painted Our Age, Nastaroids established the Society of Women Artists in Zagreb. Our age was painted in oil on canvas and the integral part of the painting is the massive non-profiled black wooden frame which carries four circular relief applications. Those applications do not have by any means an incidental or decorative function, <clears throat> but their very shape is the sign which signifies literary circular movement and it is also movement, turbulence, represented by the very painted field. The painting of Nastaroids with the very shape of painterly frame denies the notions of stability, consistency, and balance. It is in the shape of rhombus. The physical body of the painting balances in one spot of continuously eloping balance, and the four corners of the rhombus are marked on the frame by circular applications whose, whose internal edge is cut in the shape of a circular saw. In the upper application, placed directly above the vertex of God the Father, the artist's initials are inscribed, and in the lower, placed under the portraits of eminent citizens who are wearing cylinders in solemn suits indicative of their social status and authoritarian positions, inscribed is the year 1928, and above it with the capital letters, letters text, Our Age. The performative of the painting of Nastaroids, whose referential fields holds the constative title, is established in, in its centrifugal rhythm. The field of the image is structured in a circle of concentric regis registers within one uniquely painterly plane. A spiraling line is explicated as the representation of a circular saw. As a consequence of the saw's rotation, heads literally fly around. Caught in a spining or fatal centrifuge, amongst the inductors of the spiral, the representatives of all layers of society are depicted, with their racial, religious, gender, class, ideological affiliations shown. They are priests, communists, prostitutes, anarchists, soldiers, pin-up girls, artists, cannon tubes, activist slogans, painters' palettes, negroid cherubs, tank caterpillars, sickle and hammer, Bibles, cut-off ears. Death to the beautiful, long live corruption, long live mess, end of art, down with intelligence, communism destruction, peace treaty, peace, and more similar slogans written on painted papers which fly over brooks of, of blood. In her short autobiographic text written in the late 1940s, Nastaroids depicts her anti-fascism, and in doing so, she mentions the painting Our Age that was exhibited on her retrospective exhibition in 1938 in Art Pavilion at the same place where her re uh, retrospective exhibition is taking place just now. She explicitly argues that in 1938, she decided to withdraw herself from the public life. Unlike the autobiography she began to write in the last year of the First World War, in the first person singular, the text from the late 1940s is written in the third person, quote, 
At her comprehensive exhibition in the old art pavilion, she gives a lecture about the collapse of the old culture on the unavoidable turn, the words catastrophe out of which the new culture will be born. And the contours of that culture are still invisible in art. In the painting, Our Age, she talks precisely about that, but it was unintelligible for her contemporaries. She also gives a lecture on the radio, but it was certainly also unintelligible for the most of the listeners. Her relatives thought she was a bit crazy. And so the year 1941 came. The resistance of the all fighter for the human rights was immediately awakened in her. When she saw the first enemy's token, she realized that the colors, red and yellow, were the same as the colors of her crazy painting. She felt contraction around her hurt heart like the fighter before running into the battle. She immediately started to abet her friends to show their resistance, and she helps the first hard beginnings of the National Liberation War until 1943, when she and the comrade Onslow were denounced by two greedy servants of the enemy, the Eustachi, and imprisoned. Nasteroids and Alexandrina also were released from prison after three months because of the lack of the evidences. After the Second World War, the new disappointment came. Their house confiscated by Eustachi was not returned to them by their partisan comrades. Moreover, in 1950s, when the modernist ideology was produced by the American art criticism and adopted in the historiography of Croatian art, Nastaroit's art was evaluated as female painting of lesser quality. As we know today, the international high modernism became the strong weapon of the Cold War, and the apoliticality was required from the works of art in order to be regarded as really modern. Nasteroids was never apolitical, for to paint the self-portrait in drag in 1914 was a political deed, then as well as it is today. She was fully aware that personal is political. Thank you.